Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about network redundancy. You see in the diagram on the left on this slide, we've got an example network and there's no redundancy at all in this network. Everything is a single point of failure. Looking at it from the enterprise point of view, you can see where I've put in the red line. That shows the demarcation point between the enterprise and the service provider. The SP router is the service provider router. R1 is the enterprise WAN edge, wide area network edge router. So from R1, we've got a single connection going to a single service provider router. We've only got that one WAN edge router, R1. We've got a single core distribution layer switch and our single access switches. So if any one of those devices goes down, our PCs are going to lose connectivity. So no redundancy there. That's quite common though for small branch offices where the cost of adding redundant devices wouldn't be justified. In larger offices though, the cost will be justified because the cost of an outage would be more expensive. So we're gonna to want to have redundancy there. The point of redundancy is to eliminate single points of failure. So if any single device goes down, there's another device already in place which will take over. So in the example you see on the slide now, we've got two WAN edge routers, R1 and R2, which are connected to two service provider routers, SP1 and SP2 with separate links. We've got a pair of core distribution layer switches and our access layer switches have got dual uplinks going to them. So if any of the service provider routers or the WAN edge routers or the core distribution layer switches goes down or any of the links there go down, we still maintain connectivity. Now, you might have noticed that we don't have redundancy at the access layer. You see access layer switch three here. If that goes down, then the PCs that are connected in will lose connectivity. This is normal because desktop PCs typically just have one network card. They can only connect into one switch anyway. An exception to this would be servers, which will often have redundant NICs. So for your servers, you'll usually put in redundant access layer switches. But if an access layer switch goes down, it's only the PCs that are connected to that one switch, which will lose connectivity. All of the other PCs in the building that are connected into different switches will still maintain connectivity. If we compare that with the first slide, where if say R1 or our core distribution layer switch went down, everything in the building loses connectivity. With the second example here, where we have built redundancy into the solution, we've got full redundancy on our service provider links, our WAN edge routers, and our core distribution layer switches. With the example topology I gave you, we've got a clear demarcation point between layer three and layer two. The links between our WAN edge routers, R1 and R2, and going up to the service provider, they're all layer three links, meaning the interfaces have got IP addresses on them and we're gonna be running routing. The downstream links from R1 and R2, will go. the downstream devices from there are layer two devices. The core distribution layer switches for the example are going to be layer two only. The reason 
reason I've done this is because it makes it easier to explain and to understand if I've got a clear boundary between layer three and layer two. But if this was a real world deployment, we probably would have deployed layer three switches for our core distribution layer switches. For everything I'm going to teach you during the section, it doesn't really make any difference. Everything still applies. It's just easier to understand what's going on with the routing and switching when we've got that clear layer three and layer two boundary. Okay, so in the example here, how are we going to configure the connectivity from our WAN edge routers and going upstream and also down to our PCs? Well, redundancy and failover are relatively easy to implement for layer three routing. If you look at our routes on R1 here, it's got a direct connection to the service provider router at SP1. So we'll have a default static route pointing upstream there. So our route is IP route 0, .0, .0, .0, .0. 0, 0, 0, 0. the next hop address is the sp1 router at 203.0.113.1 now we want redundancy in case the sp1 router or the link to the router goes down so we have a backup route for that which is going to point to r2 so if the connectivity to sp1 goes down from r1 we can send traffic to r2 which will then send the traffic up to sp2 so our backup route is also going to be a static default route O dot O dot O dot O, O dot O dot O dot O, and the next hop address is R2 at 10.10.20.2. Now, on this backup route, we give it a higher administrative distance of 5 because I don't want to load balance my internet bound traffic to SP1 and to R2 when I send it from R1. I want it to always go up the direct link to SP1 unless that goes down, and then I want to send it to R2. So I need to make the route to SB1 a more preferred route than the route to R2. The way I do that is by manipulating the administrative distance. So on the first route to SB1, I don't specify an administrative distance. It's a static route, so the administrative distance will be 1. On the backup route going to R2, I specify an administrative distance of five. The lower the administrative distance, the better. So the second route with an AD of five is only gonna come into effect if the first one goes down. If the link to SP1 goes down, then the router will automatically fail over to using that backup route. For traffic going downstream to the PCs on the 10.10.10 .10 network, well, R1 has got an interface on the inside, gigabit ethernet 0 slash 1, which has got IP address 10.10.10.2. .10 so it's already got an interface that is in that subnet, so I don't need to configure a route. However, if interface gig 0 slash 1 goes down, I want to have a backup route going down to the PCs. So that's why I have IP route 10.10.10.0, 255.255.255.0 with a next hop address of 10.10.20.2, again pointing over to R2. I don't need to specify administrative distance because the default administrative distance on a connected route is zero. It's always going to be the most preferred. The default AD on a static route is going to be one. So this is going to be the backup route anyway, even without having to change the AD. So that's how we configure our routes and our backup routes on R1. On R2, we're going to be doing the same configuration, except R2 will use SP2 as its preferred route out to the internet, and R1 will be used for the backup routes. Okay, so that was our layer three redundancy information, but we also need to worry about how are the PCs going to send their traffic upstream and out to the internet. We're going to need to have redundancy configured there as well. That's what we're going to discuss in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.